Okay, I hope everyone can see this. If I can just um, get feedback, if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Clearly. Thank you very much. So, good evening, everyone. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you, PSN, um, especially Dr. Villanueva, Dr. Montemayor, Dr. Gomez, for that invitation to give this lecture on kidney transplantation in the time of COVID. I have nothing to disclose, and here is an outline of my talk for this evening. I will review literature describing the clinical presentation and early outcomes amongst kidney transplant recipients with COVID-19. Then I will cite some recommendations regarding immunosuppression management in infected recipients, share some guidelines regarding outpatient management of stable and infected recipients, and provide some insights regarding programmatic management and infection control for kidney transplant programs. Finally, discuss the factors to consider in determining whether to proceed versus delay kidney transplantation during the pandemic. Before proceeding, I think it's important to acknowledge that the evidence behind what we know has limitations. There is an absence of prospective or randomized control trials in the kidney transplant population. In addition, the duration of follow-up in relation to outcomes is short, and findings of published studies may not be generalizable to the Philippine population. Most of the data that we have come from case series or case reports, expert recommendations, and opinions. Of note, recently, very thorough and detailed guidelines were provided by the Philippine Society of Nephrology and the Philippine Society for Transplant Surgeons for Kidney Transplantation during the COVID-19 pandemic. In learning about the clinical presentation and early outcomes of the disease, there are several questions of interest. So first, how do kidney transplant patients present? And is the presentation any different from the general population? And number two, how do kidney transplant patients fare? Do they have worse outcomes than the general population? So here I've listed several case series that have been published. Uh, they were published pretty early in the pandemic. Uh, but note that the very, note the very small patient numbers included in these studies. As far as patient characteristics, patients were generally and their a broad range of median time from kidney transplant. The cohorts from New York reported high prevalence of diabetes and hypertension as comorbidities. Most patients presented with fever and cough. Most studies reported high CRPs and there was high prevalence of bilateral and multifocal infiltrates. Majority of patients had their immunosuppression reduced, mainly through withdrawal of the anti-metabolite. Investigational therapies utilized in these series were included hydroxychloroquine with plus minus azithromycin and tocilizumab. Um, so here are just a few of the tables in these reports. Again, these were published very early on, and I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite uh, sure that these are still how centers are practicing currently, apart from withdrawing the anti-metabolite. Moving on, um, as far as outcomes, there was a variable death rate, though three reports noted death rates of up to 25 to 30% among their patients that got admitted. So to summarize, Patients with uh, COVID-19 and who have kidney transplants appear to be similar, present similarly to the general population, although the presentation and disease severity appear to be variable. The most common intervention employed has been reduction of immunosuppression with variable use of investigational therapies. And the, there have been variable mortality rates reported to be as high as 25 to 30%. However, there is not enough data to make conclusions regarding these outcomes. What about management of immunosuppression in the time of COVID-19? What should we do with immunosuppression in infected recipients? Well, given the absence of prospective or RCT data, 
we turn to expert recommendations issued by transplant societies. So I have some excerpts posted here. I don't think, I think some of these may not be quite up to date, uh, but here is the Transplantation Society or TTS uh, recommendation. Changes in immunosuppression are not well studied in the transplant population. Calibration of dose reduction has to balance consequences of rejection. The AST notes that the impact of immunosuppression on COVID-19 is not currently known, but decreasing immunosuppression should be considered for infected recipients if no recent rejection episodes. The British Transplantation Society provides a bit more detail in their guidelines. They note that we should exclude all other causes of fever and symptoms. They actually go on to say that the anti-proliferative agents should be discontinued and resumed after full recovery. As far as calcineurin inhibitors, these should be reviewed and minimized in early disease. They should be reduced or discontinued in severe or progressive disease. And as far as high dose steroids are concerned, they can be counterproductive in early disease, but may be considered in progressive pulmonary disease or ARDS. Regarding resumption of immunosuppression, um, in addition, the PTS states, consider restarting immunosuppression 14 days after onset of symptoms if symptom-free in absence of antipyretics for a minimum of three days. This was a Twitter poll that was posted very early on uh, by one of the a transplant nephrologists asking the Twitter community, kidney transplant patient recovers after COVID-19 hospitalization where an MMF was DC'd and CNI continued. There is no AKI but residual fatigue. When do you restart MMF? And as you can see, you know, the poll is variable. Most people said I, they would do it after 14 days and there's just a lot of comments. Um, and in my own practice uh, with my colleagues, we were having the same discussion and really have some difficulty with reaching a consensus. What about calcineurin inhibitors? So I, I wanted to share this because I thought it was an interesting perspective article published in the Journal of the American Society of Nephrology highlighting that CNIs may inhibit viral replication in vitro. Um, specifically, the cyclophilin family members and FK506 binding proteins were identified as interaction partners for SARS-CoV proteins. In addition, because CNIs reduce cell proliferation and concomitant production of other cytokines, question remains is that could they have a role in reducing the cytokine release syndrome associated with uh, COVID-19? I'm sure most of you are familiar with the recovery trial, which was a study of adult non-transplant patients that received dexamethasone, six milligrams for 10 days versus usual care. So in our center, we have applied this data to our, our own transplant populations. And, and these are the guidelines that we follow. And by no means are these um, you know, set in stone, but they're simply guidelines. So hospitalized patients with COVID-19 who require oxygen support, we give them dexamethasone six milligrams daily for 10 days unless it's contraindicated. And if they are discharged prior to the completion of this course, we give a prescription to complete that 10 day course after discharge. For those who are not on oxygen supplements, we do not give them steroids. What about remdesivir? Based on preliminary data from the ACTT1 trial, which demonstrated a shorter duration of illness among adult patients with COVID-19 who received remdesivir versus placebo, our center has the following guidelines for remdesivir use outside of a clinical trial. So patients that are hospitalized with confirmed uh, COVID-19 and are, have one of the following clinical situations. So they are on greater than four liters of supplemental oxygen or are in non or have non-invasive ventilation, and the onset of symptoms was less than or equal to 14 days. Or patient has been is now an invasive mechanical ventilation and the onset of symptoms was less than seven days. Uh, we do limit from the severe use for patients who have medical conditions that would limit six-month survival in the absence of COVID-19. And also note that there are contraindications to remdesivir, notably 
an EG for less than 30 ml per minute was um, exclusion criteria in the trial. I'd like to move on now to the management of outpatients, um, kidney transplant recipients during the pandemic. <clears throat> Listed here, some general guidelines for prevention and testing. So prevention includes, you know, obvious things like practicing of social distancing and hand hygiene. These should be constantly reinforced with both patients and healthcare workers. The utilization of telemedicine encounters when possible. This will lessen exposure to other individuals and reduce travel. Taking precautions with blood draws uh, when patients go to the lab. And then a careful assessment of risk and benefit for those who are needing biopsies. So how, you know, what is your index of suspicion for an acute rejection or uh, something else going on that, you, that would warrant a biopsy? As far as diagnostic testing, um, we do test every symptomatic patient and we consider testing for any patient that uh, has been exposed to a patient that is known to have COVID. But this really depends on the availability of testing locally and what the current resources and needs are. Even if testing is negative, patients should be managed presumptively as positive if they have characteristic symptoms. And you should always consider the sensitivity of the test and the need to repeat testing if negative. And when I mention testing here, I am referring to the RT-PCR and not the antibody test. What are some indications to hospitalize? So these are some recommendations provided. Signs and symptoms of shortness of breath, refractory diarrhea, vomiting, can't maintain hydration, can't take meds by mouth, confused, having worsening fevers, hypoxic. And then anyone with a clinical concern for high risk to decompensate. So older individuals, those who have a lot of comorbidities, and patients who are unable to provide self-care at home. So if you have patients that live by themselves or have minimal support, perhaps they should be hospitalized. And then laboratory and imaging findings of concern would include AKI, liver injury, very high CRPs, um, and an abnormal chest x-ray. For documented cases that are stable, we recommend they self-isolate at home for at least 14 days and at least seven days after resolution of symptoms. There should be frequent communication between the transplant team and the patient. So uh, at our center, we call them every day to make sure that they are doing okay. As far as immunosuppression, uh, the, the authors of this article recommend considering uh, decreasing the dose of the anti-metabolite. So, if they're on a gram twice a day of MMF, perhaps going down to 500 DID, similar to what we do for patients who get CMV or BK. Uh, and this really is a, a way of balancing the severity of illness versus uh, risk of rejection, or at least this needs to be taken into account. This was a study published by the group from Columbia University in New York City of their experience in managing 49 kidney transplant recipients who had known or suspected COVID-19 who were initially managed as outpatients. So these patients underwent outpatient monitoring through telemedicine or phone calls. Uh, patient characteristics are listed here. Um, median age, 49 years old, 42 months median time from transplant, 27% were diabetic, and about half were confirmed, half were PUIs. Um, majority had a fever, almost half, over half of them had a cough, and 39% were short of breath. So ultimately, 32% of these patients, or 13 of them, required hospitalization about eight days median uh, time from symptom onset to the hospital stay. And who were the patients that were more likely to get admitted? Well, those who had dyspnea, and then those who had a higher median baseline creatinine. So those who were hospitalized had a baseline creatinine of about two, and those who did not require hospital stay um, had a baseline of about 1.3. But there was really no difference between the median time from transplant um, to COVID-19 infection as far as who needed to be hospitalized. I will now briefly touch on program management, specifically talking about general strategies to reduce infection risks for patients and healthcare workers. So 
I think I don't really need to emphasize a lot of this because I'm sure uh, everyone is well aware of the need for PPEs, avoidance of exposure, so limiting the trips to the hospital, limiting trips to the clinic, and limiting the number of individuals that the patients actually interact with. Um, there should be liberal environmental disinfection, so disinfecting the clinic uh, between patients is very important, disinfecting the stethoscope, disinfecting um, other materials that come in contact with patients and healthcare workers. Uh, screening of patients through temperature checks and symptom assessment, although in my experience, this really has not been very effective. We have a lot of patients that get through screening at the front door only to get to our clinic complaining of classic symptoms, uh, but we still do it. And then importantly, cohorting of patients, uh, not only in the clinic, but also in the hospital. So for example, you know, if you have patients that are suspected to have COVID and they need to get tested, you really probably, we, at least what we've done is we have designated sites or areas where this testing will occur so as not to expose other non-infected or, you know, well patients uh, that are also getting other testing done. And then just looking at it by in relation to the different phases of transplant care, uh, for patients that are pre-transplant have, let's say, are scheduled for surgery, consider quarantining both the living donor and the recipient for 14 days. I mean, obviously there are challenges to this if the recipient needs to go to dialysis three times a week. But for the most part, at least uh, staying at home as much as they can. And then obtaining donor and recipient COVID-19 RT-PCR testing prior to the transplant. At our center, we do it 48 hours prior to the scheduled surgery. As far as transplant is concerned, um, I'm not going to provide very specific recommendations here, but only to say that use the least potent immunosuppression that your patient's immunologic risk would allow you to. Um, at our center, we actually... Uh, at baseline, use lymphocyte depletion for pretty much all of our patients. We rarely use basiliximab, but with the onset of the pandemic, we've actually modified our immunosuppression protocol to use uh, basiliximab more liberally. And I think in the beginning, we were trying, we were learning as far as what you know who these patients should be, and as a result, we actually developed uh, two acute rejection episodes in the last month. So. I think the lesson there is recognize that, you know, if you don't give them the appropriate immunosuppression at the onset, you will or might end up with a rejection, which would necessitate even more immunosuppression down the road. So I think, um, you know, looking at what the immunologic profile is would be very important. And then for post-transplant, uh, making sure your patients stay in a COVID-free transplant unit or floor, um, when they go home, the recipient and their household contacts should quarantine or social distance as much as they can. And then for follow-ups, um, although you know we obviously need to see patients to look at the wound, take the staples out, pull out the drain, uh, you would probably want to use telemedicine um, as a supplement, supplement to your usual clinic visits. Perhaps this can limit the follow-up visits that are required. This was an interesting paper that was published in the American Journal of Transplant very recently, um, recommending the use of the Hayden matrix to guide providers to identify strategies to minimize COVID-19 infections among transplant patients. So the Hayden matrix is a framework used for injury prevention and response strategies. Um, and it's also been used in previous pandemics, including influenza and SARS. So this matrix investigates host and environmental factors, which include physical and sociocultural, during three time points. So the pre-event, event, and the post-event. So some of this I've already touched on. Um, so minimizing recipient travel, um, individualized donor selection um, to minimize anticipated DGF. So this is, has more to do with deceased donors. And then recipient selection also to minimize anticipated DGF. So you, you really want to select recipients and if it's a deceased donor kidney, where you would think that their hospital stay is not going to be very long. Um, consideration of underlying comorbidities, 
um, and the risk communication to patient and staff are also very important. Um, as far as the environment is concerned, I touched on the PPE, um, but it's also important to know that increased capacity for COVID-19 cases should be available if needed. Um, and then the capacity to quarantine patients the availability of medical equipment and potential therapies if patients do contract COVID. And then socio-cultural, I think it's very important to understand <clears throat> that providers adhere to infection control policies, resources are allocated and prioritized. Um, for patients, psychological support is very important, financial support, having the appropriate finances and the um, support from the communities for these patients to succeed post-transplant. Okay, the final part of my talk is discussing proceeding versus uh, with versus delaying transplant. And I will warn you that, you know, I'm not going to be giving any specific recommendations in this, but simply providing some uh, something, some guidelines on what factors there are to consider. So here I have a few listed, which I think um, even in our center, when we were trying to develop sort of a, a uh, guideline on who we would proceed with, these were the things we thought about. So for your recipient, how urgent is the indication to transplant? Are they on their last access? Are they not doing well on dialysis? Are they, um, you know, having a very poor quality of life, for example? And then are you able to test the donor and the recipient for COVID-19? Are you able to get the RT-PCR done? So this actually applies more for deceased donor transplants. So in the beginning of the pandemic, we had trouble with deceased donors because our testing turnaround time was, uh, I think, over 12 hours. So there was really no, you know, it was very, cutting it very close to having such cold, long cold ischemic times to get the transplant done. But over the course of the last uh, two months, we've reduced our turnaround time to about four hours. So that's one of the considerations that we had for resuming our deceased donor program. And then the third here I listed is the risk of infection post-transplant. So this really depends on what the prevalence of the COVID-19 is in the community. Um, <clears throat> I think it's hard sometimes to get a general sense of what the true prevalence is if you haven't been testing the general population, and we know that you know a lot of patients are actually in asymptomatic. Uh, at our center, we got uh, sort of a feel for how high the prevalence was because a lot, actually, all patients that came in for elective surgery got tested for COVID, and we found that our prevalence among these asymptomatic patients that were being tested pre-op was actually only less than one percent. Um, so with that data, we felt that it was safe to proceed. Um, know, though, that the risk of infection post-transplant must be weighed with the risk of infection in the dialysis unit um, and also with the risk of remaining on dialysis. So we know that transplant confers improved survival over remaining on dialysis. So delaying transplant would potentially give your patient more risk. Um, and then in the HD unit, if they contract uh, COVID there, the mortality rates also appear to be very high. I think um, the fifth point is very important and not, you know, to non-nephrologists, it's not very obvious, but <clears throat> the risks to the living donor is very important to consider. So as we know, uh, living donor surgery is probably the only surgical procedure that our community um, our community participates in, wherein the, the, the donor does not derive any medical benefit to undergoing surgery. So the risks that we are taking in behalf of the donor by proceeding with transplant should be considered. And part of this is if you bring a donor to the hospital, they stay in the hospital, they go through surgery, are you putting them at increased risk for contracting COVID-19? And if they do, what are their risks uh, as far as poor outcome post-op? So at our center, we also thought about this and recognized that the risks for the donor contracting COVID-19 in the hospital is probably very, very low. 
And because donors are quite healthy, in fact, the healthiest surgical patient you could probably have, uh, we felt that, um, the, at least based on data, that the limited data that we have, that the risks to the donor would be minimal. So having said that, though, informed consent becomes increasingly important, not only for the recipient, but for the donor as well. And the last bullet here is resource utilization. So understanding what the trend is of the pandemic in the community, how many ICU beds um, will be required, how many hospital beds will be required, how many ventilators, um, what about staffing, how many nurses do we have? Um, so do we want to put an additional burden on the healthcare system um, by doing elective transplants? And I call it elective with quotation marks because as we know, not all these transplants are purely elective um, because there is a risk to delaying transplant. So at our center, again, I'm going back to our experience uh, because that's really what I can talk about. We in the beginning halted all our transplants because we did not know what our resources were going to be four to six weeks after the onset of the pandemic. When we saw that uh, we had stable new cases, stable amounts of patients, numbers of patients in the hospital that were admitted occupying a stable number of ICU beds, then we felt more confident that undertaking transplants would not eat up all of our hospital resources. And not only hospital resources, but also personnel resources. So here is a very actually interesting study from the group at Johns Hopkins. Um, that is still in press and um, is available online. So this is the group of Dori Segev uh, who have published multiple calculators on the internet in this website called transplantmodels.com. So their data is based on U.S. data, but I thought this was interesting to try to see how we can apply um, sort of specific patient scenarios. So. In this study, they did a simulation of doing an immediate kidney transplant versus delaying until after the pandemic for different patient phenotypes under a variety of potential COVID-19 scenarios. So they have an online calculator, which I will try to access with the next slide, um, but they used machine learning approaches to evaluate important aspects of this modeling. And what they found was that the greatest influence on benefit versus harm were acquisition risk of COVID-19, the case fatality rate for both waitlisted patients or dialysis patients and transplanted patients, the length of the pandemic, so how long you would have to wait um, to delay your transplant, and then waitlist priority for those who are listed for deceased donor kidney. And they found that in most scenarios, at least here in the United States, COVID-19 dynamics and patient characteristics, immediate KT provided survival benefit. So they found that KT only began showing evidence of harm in scenarios where case fatality rates were substantially higher for KT recipients, like a greater than 50% fatality than for waitlisted patients. So this is a picture of that calculator, and I'm going to actually try to access it. So we can try to input a few values to just give you an idea or a feel of how this works. So this is the website, transplantmodels.com, COVID SIM. Um, so if you have a community COVID acquisition risk, and let's go to you know, high sustained. So this is the highest where you can get COVID 10% per month in months one to 12 and 3% per month thereafter. If you're on the wait list, you're doing dialysis, what is your risk of getting COVID? So let's say you're two times more likely to get it. And I'm, I'm just making this up. Risk of nosocomial COVID infection at transplant. Let's say you have, you know, you're in the hospital, less than 10% chance, for example. And if you delay the transplant, so let's say this pandemic is going to go on and on and we're going to delay it by 12 months. It's the case fatality rate for the wait list that let's say medium and the case fatality rate for post-transplant let's say is high, which is what's reported in the literature. So this and then your patient characteristics, so I'm, I'm not going to change this. Let's say living donor, 
let's say diabetic, no transplant, race, and then insurance, I'll keep that private. So you can see that calculator <clears throat> adjusts this Kaplan-Meier curve based on whether immediate KT versus delay is favored. So for this particular patient in this particular community profile, uh, immediate KT is favored. So five-year survival, immediate KT of 50, about 52%. Five-year survival with delay about 47%. So life months gained over the first five years, 3.4. So I think this is very interesting. Obviously the numbers, a lot of this is guesswork as far as what's present in your community, but um, I think you could, you could certainly try this out and just put your patient uh, fa factors in there to see what you get. Okay. Um, I'm just making sure I don't close my PowerPoint. Bear with me. So to summarize uh, what I discussed in the last 30 minutes, there are several case series that describe clinical presentation similar to that of the general population with variable disease severity and mortality rates. Immunosuppression management strategies are based on expert opinion. The most common strategy is that of reduction or withdrawal of the anti-metabolite or anti-proliferative agent. The decision to reduce immunosuppression must carefully weigh disease severity against the risk of rejection. There are select indications for treatment with remdesivir and dexamethasone. This is based on non -transplant, a non-transplant population. Patients may be carefully followed as outpatients when appropriate. Reducing infection risk of both patients and healthcare workers should be of utmost priority. And the decision to proceed with the transplant should carefully consider risks and benefits given individual patient characteristics and aspects of the pandemic based on your location. Here are a few resources that I think would be helpful uh, for anyone interested in uh, getting more data. These are constantly updated. And um, I think the guidelines published by the PSN very recently are very, very helpful as well. Thank you very much. Um, I would be happy to uh, take some questions and engage in some discussions. Thank you very much, Leah. This, that was an excellent talk. And uh, I think we have learned uh, many, many things that we can apply probably in the Philippine setting regarding our practices for transplantation. Um, as we have um, earlier, uh, we were talking before the, the webinar, and we have told you that um, the PSN and the PSTS recently came out with the guidelines, a unified guidelines um, for the resumption of uh, transplant activity, which has been suspended since the start of, our, of the lockdown here in the Philippines uh, early March. And so um, I would just like to uh, share with you some of the highlights of, that, of those guidelines. And um, here in the Philippines, uh, at the moment, deceased donation, deceased donors, KT for, from deceased donors is suspended indefinitely. Um, because of uh, logistic uh, concerns. Uh, our turnaround time is a very few labs um, have a turnaround time of less than 12 hours. Um, and uh, some safety concerns also for the organ retrieval um, team. Aside from that, we, um, we only do, we will only do low or standard risk uh, patients uh, for KT and those urgently needing Mm, transplant, uh, for example, those who have uh, major or uh, problematic accesses and all. So, so definitely, uh, we will. We are not doing at the moment high, uh, highly sensi sensitized patients, uh, ABO incompatible or positive post match patients, as well as um, retransplants, second transplants. Um, there are. We did not. Uh, give any guidelines or set any guidelines for KT uh, for our patients who have recovered from COVID-19, our dialysis patients who have recovered from, uh, from COVID. And uh, thank you very much for the, the first, part of, first part of your lecture because we have minimal um, experience here or limited experience of transplant patients who became COVID infected 
So, so those are the, the, some, some major highlights in the guidelines. Yeah, I, I think the guidelines are very detailed and very thorough. So congratulations to the team that put that together. I'm actually going to print that and utilize it also in my own practice. So congratulations on that. I think, I think it was very thoughtful as far as trying to stratify low risk versus high risk recipients. I, I mean, I think the criteria that you put down there is very reasonable. Um, at our center, we did decide that any PRA is considered high risk. Um, and the reason is because, you know, every time you have an antibody, the PRA doesn't really tell you how many antibodies those are, what the strength is. So it could be, you know, one uncommon antibody giving you a PRA of zero or you have, you have multiple there. So our group decided that we would consider any PRA, any PRA as high risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's really because our center has always used lymphocyte depletion. So in our practice, we're not used to using basiliximab. So it's sort of outside of our comfort zone. And so I think that's also one of the problems of the pandemic is we're forced to practice outside of our comfort zone. So when you're practicing outside of your comfort zone, you're learning and relearning a lot of things. And a lot of it is trial and error, um, you know, identifying things you would do differently and opportunities for improvement. But in our patient population, there really is not a whole lot of room for error. So um, I think all of us are struggling with making some of these decisions of weighing risks versus benefits. So I think dialogue like this is very important. Uh, others' perspectives is very important. So I'm always, you know, when I see other transplant professionals, um, you know, online actually, uh, I always ask them, you know, what are you doing at your center? Because we like to sort of modify what we do based on what others are doing just to make sure we're in line. But I think that the guidelines that you crafted are very reasonable and in line with what most people are recommending. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. So uh, we have lots of questions, Bea. Okay. <laughs> uh, for our, <laughs> for our, our first question um, is from uh, Dr. Ray Tan. Do you recommend PCR testing pre-transplant for all immediate healthcare staff taking care of the recipient? So um, I personally do not have um, the expertise to make these recommendations. So I will tell you what our center recommends and we, we do not test the healthcare workers. So a lot of this decision making also depends on the availability of the resource. All so right. in fact, at our center, if you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19, you're actually not to be tested. You're only supposed to monitor yourself for symptoms for 10 days, wear a mask, continue working. That's what we do here. Um, and it's because we're trying to save the tests for the people who absolutely need it. So I think, of course, testing is always good if, if it's available to you and it does not deny another patient or another healthcare worker that needs it more. So, so I think that's where I would leave that is way, you know, how available is the test? Um, how readily available is it? And what is the, like, what's the opportunity cost of testing asymptomatic healthcare workers? Um, and using that approach. Okay, all right. Um, another question from Dr. Lourdes uh, Resonto. For COVID workup of donor and recipient, what specimen do you get for testing? Nasal and oropharyngeal, or do you also test the blood? Yeah, so for our center, so, the, so we actually have are doing both deceased donor and living donor. So for the deceased donors, they get nasopharyngeal testing. For our living donors and our recipients, they get nasal, nasal swabs, two nasal swabs. Uh, we do not do any blood testing. Okay. It used, in the beginning, it was nasopharyngeal, but now it's moved to just bilateral nasal swabs. Okay, and you said you, you would do the swabs uh, 48 hours, at least 48 hours before the schedule. So you do not uh, have a swab test early on during the workup? It's just one swab test uh, 48 hours prior? Correct, correct. Okay. So when patients are undergoing an evaluation, we are not testing them for COVID. It is only on the pre-op. Actually, their pre-op is about one week prior to the transplant, so they come back 
get tested, get swabbed. And this is actually a policy we've instituted for all elective surgeries. So, but the transplant team was one of the first to employ this. So they prioritized running the tests for our patients before everyone else. So this is also like a hospital initiative, you know, because you have all these tests that are needing to be run, who gets prioritized? So luckily we get transplant prioritized um, pretty easily, so. Okay, I see, uh, there's another question from Dr. Joben Abraham. He is a transplant surgeon, and uh, I think you answered the first part of his question. How often do you test the healthcare workers who are involved in the transplant process? Um, at least for, you already answered that you do not routinely do the swabs, but do you do the chest x-rays at least for these patients? That's part of this question. Or yes. is it symptom-based? <clears throat> evaluation enough. Yeah, all the patients get the chest x-ray. Um, for the living donor recipients, they get their chest x-ray on pre-op, which is within a week of the scheduled surgery. For people that we call in for deceased donor kidney transplant, we get an x-ray on arrival, which is our standard for everybody that gets a transplant, they get a chest x-ray. So it's not a deviation from our protocol. We have not done chest <laughs> CT scans. Uh, we have, we have of course, screen them for symptoms, respiratory symptoms, which would be a standard screen anyway for anyone you're doing a transplant on. We have found a few asymptomatic patients to be positive for COVID-19 upon calling them in for a deceased donor. So that surprised us in the beginning. It got us very worried that there was a lot of asymptomatic ESRD patients out there. Um, but we've managed to sort of move on and continue. So we, we test them. Um, if they're positive, asymptomatic, we inactivate them, they go home. And then as far as activating people who've had COVID or who have tested positive for, uh, for COVID, I'll, I'll go, go ahead and, and say this, that what we do is we you know, delay, obviously delay and inactivate them for transplant for at mm -hmm. least three to four weeks. And then we get repeat testing and it has to be negative times two. Um, I think at least uh, 48 hours apart and clearly without any symptoms. All right, thank you. There's a question here uh, from Dr. Uh, Romina Danilan. Are you doing highly sensitized patients now? Yes, we are. Um, in the beginning, we were not, I think. So just to give you an idea of what our program did, we shut down for about four weeks. We completely stopped living donors. We completely stopped deceased donors. And then after four weeks, when we thought that we, we found that the cases of COVID were not really increasing, that they were stable, we resumed with deceased donor transplants in very selected patients, most usually <clears throat> low risk, um, where we did not expect that they would stay in the hospital beyond you know, three or four days. But the exception to that rule was the very highly sensitized recipients because in the U.S., there is actually a special allocation policy for people with PRAs that are very high. So those with PRAs that are 98, 99, or 100 get priority for um, some of these kidney transplants. And if you have a patient with a PRA of 98, 99, 100, they get an offer for a deceased donor. That's a very you know, unique special thing that they might not get again for many years. So I think for that specific patient population, because it's a deceased donor kidney that's being offered to someone who might not get this chance again, we felt that the risk of having to use antibody depletion um, therapy with the risk of you know, being on dialysis forever and never getting a transplant, that the benefit of getting a transplant outweighed the risk. So that's why our center did that. Um, and then after about two months, so in May, our center actually resumed normal operations. Uh, Mid-May, we resumed our living donor program. We're up and running like normal. We actually had the most number of transplants we've ever done in May, interestingly. Um, I think it might be because um, there's less transplant centers that are fully operational right now. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. That's good to know. Um, another question from Dr. Danilan. Cyclosporin and mTOR inhibitors have some antiviral properties. Is there a preference for them during this COVID era? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, our center is very partial to cyclosporin for patients that get BK nephropathy, actually. We switch most people with BK nephropathy from tacrolimus to cyclosporin. So the idea of using cyclosporin for patients with COVID-19 has been brought up. Um, it's been thought that the cyclophilin um, protein uh, interacts with the SARS-CoV protein and, and might, you know, inhibit the virus. So there was one paper that I actually did not cite on my case series that looked at this, but it was a very small number. Um, and I, I didn't think it was worth relaying those results to give people a false idea of, you know, you should be using cyclosporin based on a very small case series. But to answer the question, yes, this has been brought up. I think people are trying to study it. I do not think there is data that is good enough to be shared to influence mm -hmm. practice. So, mm -hmm. so at our center, we have not preferentially switched them to cyclosporin, but I would not be surprised if down the road that might be one strategy that we can use. All right. Okay. Um, a third question from Dr. Adangilan. Do you do a baseline chest CT scan prior to kidney transplantation for our recipients? Yeah, we have not, but other centers have done this but our center has not. And so far, you did not have any um, like problems with yeah, uh, so, COVID? So, yeah, so far, we haven't had COVID-19 in recipients we transplanted oh. during the pandemic. Right, now, We have a few patients that got a kidney transplant in Feb, February. So that's like the newest transplants of, that have gotten it. But so far, mm -hmm. we haven't gotten anyone um, that trans that got transplanted from March onwards that have contracted the virus. Um, I will also say and 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 insert this that you know obviously there is that risk of concern for transmission of COVID from the donor to the recipient because the receptor for the virus is present on the kidney. So our working, you know, precautions. Our precautions work around the hypothesis that if you have a donor that has COVID-19, it can get transmitted into the recipient. Okay, okay, all right. Um, another question from Dr. Lynn Gomez. Has your center considered transplanting organs from COVID-positive heart-beating donors? Oh, so I think I answered you preemptively, Dr. Gomez. We have not, um, and I think there was an article that was published recently, an opinion piece from one of the, I think, University of Washington. They made the argument that perhaps for heart and liver transplant, these donors can be considered, but at least for, for kidney, because the receptor is present in the kidney, the receptor yes. for the virus, uh, we do not, we do not um, accept any of these organs that have COVID-19. Okay, so... Um... Next question from Dr. Dangilan. Since the recipient and donor are both COVID negative, does the OR team uh, just wear level three PPEs in your center? Yes, yes, that's all. That's all they wear. I'm not sure what level three is, but they do not take. They do not. They do not wear. Um, I actually do not want to to say that because I'm never in the OR. Uh, but my understanding is um, once they're COVID-19 negative, they wear regular surgical masks. Okay. All right. Um, are, those, are there additional, additional pre-transplant workup that you added because of the pandemic aside from the RT-PCR? No, we None. have just been... So I think what changed with our program is more of the process by which we evaluate patients how we see them in clinic. So I will say that, you know, here when we have uh, pre-transplant evaluation and workup, they have to go to a class, they have to meet with dietitian, they have to meet with, you know, social worker, they have to see the physician. So what we did, and because of the pandemic, was to streamline that process. So we did away with any classes in groups. So we made a video and that's, sort of what we wa have the patients watch. We did away with face-to-face -face dietitian or social work appointments. So all of that is done telemedicine. So the only person that that uh, recipient undergoing evaluation and even the donor and pre-op, the only person they actually come in contact with is the physician who needs to examine them. 
So I think more than changing this, the tests we order, it was really the process of how do we lessen the risk for potential recipients and donors. Thank you. More questions, Bea? It's okay. Sure. Um, have you seen patients with COVID and rejecting at the same time, or how would you manage this? And how would you manage this patient? Yeah, luckily we have not. Um, at our center, I think you know our cases are very low compared to what's been reported in New York, um, and I have not actually seen a case report of acute rejection in someone with COVID as of yet. Uh, as I yeah. scoured through the literature, I did not come across any. Um, I think how would I treat somebody with COVID? It will depend on what their clinical status is. I think if they've recovered from the virus, similar to let's say someone who gets CMV, patients who get CMV end up with rejections down the road. So, you know, I would treat them with steroids for sure. And then, you know, I think utilizing uh, thymoglob antithymocyte globulin right now during COVID, you really have to have a good reason for you to do to use that. Uh, we've had several rejections outside of COVID, meaning patients who did not get COVID but have had rejection in the last three months. And we've been very hesitant to treat them with antithymocyte globulin. We, mm -hmm. we have done it for a couple, but we gave very, very low doses, um, lower than what our usual protocol is. And uh, how low is low? What what doses do you mean? <laughs> what, what is yeah, low? so at our <laughs> center, we follow the very classic literature of how much to treat acute rejection. We actually give them seven days, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Um, it's a lot of uh, anti-thymocyte -thym globulin. So in response to the pandemic, we have now reduce this acute rejection treatment to about 4.5 milligrams to 6 milligrams per kilogram. So Total. over three to four days, which over I think three. other centers do as a standard anyway. Yeah, that's what also we do here. Um, yes. And uh, Dr. Cecil Manalo has a question. Please comment on the use of ATG versus baseliximab induction. I think you... Yeah. Yeah, so I think I touched on it earlier. Yes. Uh, our center, we actually do not use either ATG or uh, basiliximab. Our induction agent is alemtuzumab, which is CAMPAC. It's an anti-CD52. It's a lymphocyte depleting agent. So prior to the pandemic, we used that for every single patient that we had. Um, but with the pandemic, we had to alter our induction uh, immunosuppression protocol. So what we did was categorize people to low risk versus high risk, similar to what the PSN guidelines um, have published. So our low risk population includes anyone with a PRA that is zero. So anyone with PRA more than zero, we have still been using our standard alemtuzumab. And I think, again, that is because we are worried that if these patients get rejection later, then you end up giving them even more immunosuppression. Mm -hmm. um, so that is our bias. And again, I, I emphasize this. This is not data driven. This is simply how we are practicing and reevaluating kind of what we're experiencing and, and, and kind of learning, learning at the same time. Um, we also do a few other high risk transplants here. Like we feel that we actually transplant patients who have hepatitis C into patients who do not have hepatitis C. And based on our experience, those patients get more rejection. We do ABO incompatible. So for all those patients that are high risk, we give them alemtuzumab, which is a lymphocyte mm -hmm. depleting mm -hmm. agent. Okay, so Dr. Joyce Serna, have you uh, tried treating KT patients who had COVID-19 with lopinavir, ritonavir regimen? And thank you for the informative lecture. Thank you. Um, I, we have not at our center, and it's because the, the drugs that are investigational are highly regulated at our center. So if you want to get these drugs, you have to be enrolled in a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. So as um, you know, the transplant nephrologist, I'm unable to prescribe those drugs. Um, I, think, I think I'm sure a lot of uh, you know, or most of you know that there is a potent interaction with uh, protease inhibitors. You have to be very careful if you are to use it. it was, it's very potent. It will increase your, your CNI levels very quickly. So that would be a warning if that is a drug that you would consider. But to answer the question, we have not used it. Um, our patients have received remdesivir and uh, dexamethasone. We have not given anybody IL-6 
um, inhibitor, we have not given anybody uh, hydroxychloroquine, actually. Okay. Um, again, from Dr. Abraham, uh, do you have enhanced consent surgical forms for both donors and recipients where the risk of nosocomial COVID and all its complications are included? Yes, we do. We have very specific consent forms for both uh, donor and recipient, specific to COVID. Okay. From Dr. Lourdes Rusontok, has the transplant model been tested on actual patients? The calculator, I, maybe the calculator. Yes. No, so this is all simulation. Um, that group is very good with uh, doing a lot of simulation based on U.S. data. So that's a caveat there is they based it off on U.S. Uh, outcomes for recipients, U.S. Uh, mortality rates for waitlisted patients. So by no means and am, am I um, advocating that you use that calculator to make your clinical decisions. I just thought it was uh, worth highlighting that these were the factors to consider and, and you see how things change based on how certain factors, um, factors change. So, so, so yes, it has not been tested in, in actual patients. Okay. Um, next question is from Dr. Ding Dong Berwar. If you have a post-KT patient who needs to be admitted for another medical problem, um, example, a patient uh, who needs IV antibiotics, is it mandatory to do a swab test before hospital admission for those patients? Yeah, so, so again, I can only share what our center is doing, and I don't know if this is the ideal, but for patients who have no symptoms, um, who are transplant patients, in our hospital, we have our own transplant floor uh, where we actually have liver and kidney recipients on the same floor. If they do not have highly suspicious symptoms for COVID, they get admitted to that floor. Um, in the beginning, they were not getting tested, but as the testing became more readily available, the hospital has now tested every admission, but they are in their room already as the test is sent. So then a big challenge has been some of these tests come back positive a day later. And when okay. it comes back positive, that patient has already exposed individuals um, you know, to COVID. So our hospital says that as long as you're wearing your surgical mask, you should be fine. So in nephrology and in transplant, because we feel that we are a limited resource in our hospital, there are only you know, a certain number of fellows, there are only a certain number of people who can take care of transplant patients. We're being very extra careful as far as um, interacting with patients where the COVID test has not mm -hmm. yet come back. So again, I'm not going to offer hospital policies on what to do. I mean, my own center changes the policy all of to us as a resource, uh, but I think in general, wearing the mask is very important. And then limiting the number of people seeing patients who have not yet had the test come back is very important. So I'll share with you, um, last Friday, for example, we had an ESRD patient that was admitted. Um, and we had a fellow who saw the patient, got the history, examined them, was in full PPE for COVID because that's what our division wants them to do. We want to protect the fellows. Um, but then the COVID test was sent out and, you know, it had not yet come back. And the next fellow that saw the patient didn't realize that this COVID test had not yet come back. So it was not in full PPE. Um, and then the COVID test, of course, came back positive. But it, that really did not violate any hospital policy because our policy is to simply wear a surgical mask. So I think it becomes very distressing when you see a patient and you don't realize they have COVID and it comes back later. But I think the way I see it is this is going to be a common occurrence. I mean, COVID is going to be around for quite a bit. And I would not be surprised that all of us will be placed in such a situation at some point. Um, so I think personally, I try to limit my contacts with patients as, as much as I can. If I don't need to see them, I don't see them. If I can chart review, I will chart review. Um, so limiting the number of personnel, we try uh, to keep protect their trainees so that they don't have to see anyone with COVID. Uh, they don't see anybody with, with symptoms suspicious of COVID as much as we can.
Okay, so the idea is really to be uh, to take the necessary precautions, especially for the healthcare workers. There is a question here from from an anonymous attendee. Um, has there been any changes in the immunosuppressive uh, regimen for transplantation? Yeah, so for us, time? we have not changed our maintenance immunosuppression um, outside of the changes that we discussed on the induction protocol. Um, okay. Again, we feel that preventing rejection is just as important as um, avoiding COVID because once you get a rejection in a patient, you end up admitting them, you end up um, keeping them in the hospital, giving them more potent immunosuppression. So I think you have to balance that with, you know, making sure that um, their risks for COVID are also reduced, perhaps through the social distancing, reducing exposures and things like that. So at our center, we have not modified our maintenance immunosuppression regimen. So um, maybe you know what your immunosuppression regimen yes. is in your center? Is it steroid-free? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the reason that we use alemtuzumab for all patients is we do, we do steroid-free for low okay. risk. Mm -hmm. um, but because we're now using basiliximab more for low risk, we are not doing steroid-free with basiliximab. All so right. if we use basiliximab, we use three drugs, Tacro, MMF, Pred. If we use alemtuzumab, um, usually we're only using it now for high risk, they still get three drugs. Uh, there is, you know, maybe an exception where we feel like someone would really benefit from steroid avoidance, like a very bad diabetic, very difficult to control, obese, that kind of patient. We have maybe once or twice uh, proceeded with our usual alemtuzumab induction without steroids in, in the slow risk patient that um, probably would not do well on steroids. Okay, but you have not uh, used uh, steroid free for basiliximab induced in, induced patients? No, no not for not at our center. All right. Okay. Although that has been used, let's say in Europe, for example, they have shown mm -hmm. that that's been okay, but our center has not ventured into that. Again, we are not the most comfortable with basiliximab. We're still learning. Yes. Okay, so from Dr. Frank Giliano, it was shown that mTOR inhibitors exhibits immunostimulatory um, effects on memory CD8 plus T cells um, differentiation. If improved both quantity and quality of memory CD8 T cells in the transform trial, Everolimus with low dose CNI has lower incidence of viral infections like CMV and VK virus um, infection compared with MMF plus standard dose CNI. Do you think mTOR inhibitors can be protective of coronaviruses as well? Will it be better to give de novo mTOR inhibitors rather than um, mycophenolate nowadays? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. We were actually a part of Transform. I have I have multiple patients enrolled in that trial. Um, you know, that's a really good question that I don't think our center has really considered. Mm -hmm. um, we are just not a fan of mTORs. I'll be very honest with you. We're not a fan because even if some studies say, and in fact, some of these studies were published from our center, even if they say that, you know, we don't have wound issues or lymphocytes, we, we still see it. So I mm -hmm. think most of my patients who are in mTORs were part of Transform. Um, so we, we as a center have not um, entertained the idea of using mTORs de novo, um, but I, you cite very good basic science sort of um, uh, literature there to, to support, potentially support it. But I, you know, there's no data at this point to say that that's an effective approach. I think theoretically, potentially, yes. Uh, similar to the cyclosporin question earlier. Okay, so from an, on, an anonymous attendee, for an asymptomatic patient who tested positive for COVID, how long can you wait to work him up again, again for KP? Yeah, so we wait through um, COVID two times, 48 hours apart. And if they're both negative, then we proceed. With no and we've already transplanted one person who already, did that. Okay. So with no additional uh, tests or anything? Not just uh, I mean, apart, uh, out, uh, 
in addition to our usual, you know, they get a chest x-ray, everyone gets a chest yes. x-ray. But yes. that's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Actually, that's one of my questions <laughs> uh, early on, but at least uh, somebody asked it already. So from Dr. Uh, Benji Balmores, how soon can a previous COVID-positive recipient undergo KT? I think that's the same oh, that's, question. That's the same question. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same question. Yeah. So th uh, those are CDC guidelines as far as testing... Um, patients that were COVID free, I think. I, I believe we got that from the CDC. Yeah, I, um, there are more questions, Bea. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> just tell me if you're, <laughs> you're already tired, but... Um, I'm happy to answer a few more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe the last three questions. Mm -hmm. From Dr. Emmanuel Lennon, in your center, do you encourage lap donor nephrectomy? Than open donor nephrectomy, does COVID has any have any effect on the approach? Considering that we do only COVID negative donors, yeah. So I think um, the PSN guidelines um, highlight this that the concern is if you do open nephrectomy, they will stay in the hospital longer. So uh -huh. for us, uh, we are pretty much we only do lap donor unless there is a reason to do open. I would say 95% of our donors undergo lap. Uh, they stay on average in the hospital two to three days, mostly two days. So that minimizes that risk. And yes. I think, again, I can't emphasize enough that we should think about the risks to the donor um, and minimizing those risks because they really do not derive any medical benefit to donating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agree. Um, I think the last question from Dr. Romina Dangilan, in the COVID-positive donor, do you check for antibodies in the recipient? And if present, do you think it would be acceptable in, uh, in future to use this donor, similar to the hepatitis uh, surface antigen positive donor to a hepatitis uh, negative recipient and uh, HBS AB positive recipient? Yeah, I think the data right now is not quite there. We don't really know how to use the antibody testing. Um, at our center, we do not use antibody testing except in very specific situations. I have never ordered an antibody test on any of my patients. I think as the pandemic progresses and there are more people who become IgG positive, um, you know, I think there will be more studies on this. And so personally, I would wait until these studies are out for me to know how to utilize the data given by antibody testing. So personally, I do not have experience with it and I would not advocate for uh, using it as um, to sort of reassure me that my patient will be fine with COVID if they have an IgG that's positive. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, babe. There are Thank more questions in the chat box, but uh, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah. I have my email here. I'd be very happy to, um, let me share my screen okay. again. So I'd be very happy to connect with all of you. Um, here is my email. And if you are on social media, uh, one of the best ways to actually engage the nephrology and transplant community is by going on Twitter. And I'll make a plug for that. Uh, now to say that especially in the time of COVID it's very important to connect with I think other transplant and nephrology professionals mm -hmm. around the world one of the best ways to do it is to go on Twitter and if you want some advice on how to follow um, people that are very influential and have a lot to share I would be happy to to uh, talk you through that. So here is my contact information for anyone with questions or you want to connect offline. Okay, Bea. Thank you. Thank you, Bea. So um, even in the future, can we email you for questions? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, and I will... with our patients here. Yes, uh, thank you. And I'm, I'm by no means, you know, an expert, really, like everyone, we are, we are all learning uh, and yes. Very, very interested to hear your perspectives as well and learn from your experience. I think we're all in this together. We're just trying to figure it out one patient at a time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so um, I think uh, 
this is all for now. And uh, please keep safe. Keep safe, Bea. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Are your, are your COVID patients increasing there in the States? Our transplantations mm -hmm. are increasing here. Um, I think one of the challenges our center has is our patients are located hundreds of miles away. And so we have a lot of patients uh, admitted in hospitals outside. So we're trying to figure out how to manage them remotely with other non-transplant physicians taking care of them. So, so I think it's a challenge. Like I said, every new day brings a new challenge that we have to, to tackle and adapt to. But, but um, one of my infectious disease colleagues told me, pandemics have an end. This will end. Yes, let's all so pray for that. Sooner rather okay. than later. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Bye-bye.